I am going to uh, talk about a less researched uh, uh, area of inequality in education, and then I'm going to talk about means that we can use to uh, uh, offset that in inequality. And so this is going to start off uh, pretty dark, and then I'm going to bring it back to something more positive towards the end, some work that we can look forward to. And so uh, to start, um, the form of inequality I'm going to talk about is uh, disciplinary action, or more specifically, suspensions. Uh, which are uh, particularly impacting because it removes children from the learning environment. Um, and so to start, let's think about um, what's going on. And so this is data from the, the Department of Education on virtually all schools in the United States. Um, and it's found that uh, black students are about 14% of the total student population across the country. However, uh, they are about 44% of the students who are receiving suspensions across the country. And so there's two things to notice here, uh, is that if you look at the red bars at the end of the day, black students are more likely to be suspended than any other students. But then if you look at it compared to the blue lines, you see that it's largely disproportionate how this is happening, such that black children are three to six times more likely to be suspended than all of their peers. And so, um, I wanted to look at why this might be the case in some research uh, uh, that I did while I was here at Stanford. Uh, and so looking at that data uh, uh, to, uh, and so that, that, that's like correlational, and so there's different explanations for why that might be the case. Uh, a lot of research uh, that has looked at this uh, uh, context has uh, done it in the form of the uh, uh, perspective of the teachers. And so we might see this disproportionality because teachers uh, are disciplining students differently. They're just, uh, uh, they're biased and they're, they're more inclined to uh, suspend black students. And then another body of research looks at the student's perspective uh, and uh, thinks about it in the context of black children and or Latino and Native American children uh, are more unruly than other children or behave in a way that uh, uh, will get them into trouble. And therefore, we see this disproportionality because there's a difference in student behavior. And so with a correlation, any of those explanations can be true. I wanted to look at it experimentally uh, and uh, with the idea that I actually think that it's possible that both things are true as opposed to one or the other. And so before I start to touch on why I think it's both, um, discipline problems are consequential uh, for both teachers and students. For example, uh, 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 misbehavior is one of the top reasons for why teachers leave the profession. They feel like misbehavior is getting in the way of them doing what they came to the, the profession to do, to teach, to, uh, teach children and help them grow into responsible adults. For students, it's consequential because it, uh, uh, discipline can lead them to be uh, disengaged from school. It can uh, also, uh, because it's removing them from the learning environment, uh, lead to such things as the school to prison pipeline, a phenomenon whereby large numbers of black and Latino children are ushered out of schools and into juvenile detention, where they then face an increased likelihood of returning to adult prison uh, and then entering what Joan Peter Celia over at the law school calls a revolving door in which they are then going, going in and out of prison. And in some states with federal charges, they're ultimately disenfranchised, can't vote, can't get public housing, can't get financial aid. And so the way that where that process starts is implied in the name, it starts in the school. More specifically, it starts in the classroom. And more specifically, what I think and what I'll be talking about today is that it happens in, uh, uh, or it stems from teacher-student relationships, which is what I just said. Um, and so I then went back to psychology research to try to understand what is it that could be leading to uh, this particular problem in teacher-student relationships? And psychology had, uh, again, it's two independent bodies of work that looked at how uh, negative uh, uh, relationships can play out due, I mean, based on uh, uh, racial differences. And so one body of research looks at stereotyping. And so this is like implicit bias, but namely that racial stereotypes that are in the air can shape our uh, judgment and our decision making. Um, and so without going into it too much, but because uh, uh, there's uh, so few people who are aware of what implicit bias is, it's something that's in the air. It's stereotypes that we're exposed to. It could be from nonverbal behavior that we watch in the media that can lead us to have anti-black bias. Namely, we'll be more likely to think that black people are dangerous or aggressive. Um, and uh, uh, stereotyping is how those type of uh, uh, 
ideas that we get from the environment can shape our behaviors even beyond our awareness. Uh, and especially in contexts like uh, contexts I'm going to talk about in which there's uh, limited information and limited amount of time. There's also research on threat. And this research shows that if a student feels like they might be the victim of bias, this may lead them to disengage from that context. Uh, as it pertains to misbehavior, this might lead them to be less cooperative uh, and therefore lead to more discipline problems. And so uh, I basically uh, uh, hypothesize that both of these processes are leading to uh, the effects that we're finding. Um, and that I think that it happens through how both parties think about respect. And so teachers are coming to feel that uh, black children are uh, more disrespectful, and black and Latino children are coming to feel like teachers are more disrespectful because of the stereotypes that are in the air. Okay, and so just to put this in example, uh, let's imagine a child, let's say his name's Darnell, that'll make more sense in a moment. Uh, but Darnell uh, enjoys science and really wants to become a scientist when he grows up. Uh, and so he's going to school because he really wants to be an astronaut one day. Let's think about a teacher. Let's call her Miss Smith. That name will also make more sense in a moment. Miss Smith became a teacher because she really wanted to help children grow and learn and become responsible adults. And so what we have here are two individuals who have uh, uh, positive goals that they hope to uh, uh, reach in the classroom that they hope to reach at school. However, uh, I posit that uh, exposure to stereotypes or implicit bias that's in the air, uh, this then shapes the way that they interact with each other and the way that their relationship deteriorates over time. Uh, and then ultimately, we can see discipline problems arise. And so to put that uh, 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 more into like a, a working model, uh, we can imagine that Darnell may feel like he's not going to be treated fairly at school because he's aware of the negative stereotypes about black boys and feels that uh, uh, his teachers aren't going to treat him like he deserves to be treated. In turn, this might lead Darnell to cooperate less uh, in, in, uh, uh, in activities that are going on in the classroom. Ms. Smith might interpret uh, this lack of cooperation as a, a, a sign that Darnell is disrespectful. And so Ms. Smith may uh, want to discipline Darnell uh, severely. In turn, this communicates to Darnell, uh, or, or it's a confirmation, that he is going to be treated unfairly. And therefore, he cooperates even uh, uh, less going forward. In turn, this confirms in the teacher's mind that Darnell is a troublemaker or a bad kid, and that this is going to be a, a pattern or a problem that, they're going to have to, that she's going to have to deal with uh, consistently. And so she responds with even more severe discipline. As we, what we see here is a feedback loop, or what we like to call a recursive cycle, such that minor infractions can then grow to be large infractions, uh, and minor uh, 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 discipline or misbehavior can become major discipline. And so I want you to uh, uh, notice the yellow uh, um, arrows here, because that's really where us as psychologists can step in. This is, these are areas of subjective interpretation. That's where implicit bias can seep in. That's where stereotyping and threat can seep in. But then also, uh, what I'm going to explain with you later is that's also an area where there's levers that we can, we can shift to then improve the relationship and stop it from being deteriorated and actually make it stronger. And so I'm going to start with the top yellow arrow. Uh, arrow um, and that's the teacher's predicament or how a teacher views misbehavior. And so with uh, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, I set up an experiment um, to look at how a teacher might look at uh, misbehavior differently. Uh, going into the research, we didn't know of any experimental research on this topic, and so we kind of had to work with what we had. And what we had is that uh, there's research that shows that when teachers describe a troublemaker, they describe someone with a negative demeanor, a history of misbehavior, uh, and lower grades. Separate research uh, found that when teachers think of black students, they actually think of the exact same things. People with a history of misbehavior, people with lower grades, people with a negative demeanor. Uh, and so I then uh, hypothesized that maybe teachers are viewing students as trouble, I mean, viewing black students as troublemakers. Um, and so with that hypothesis, it then built another hypothesis that a thing with trait characteristics or attributions that are about things that won't change, like a troublemaker, it might play out in an interesting way over time, uh, such that the recursive cycle I explained might play out. And so time may be an element as well. So recruited teachers, currently practicing teachers from all across the country, uh, it was a, 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 a sample that was 
not representative of the national statistics, but very close to it, had them uh, uh, do an online survey that wanted to get at how would you discipline a child, what are their best practices for discipline. Um, and so we told them to imagine themselves as a teacher at the school. We told them uh, uh, the teacher to student ratio is 1 to 26. It's in a middle income neighborhood. All of this information to really control the environment that the teachers are imagining themselves in. Because mind you, they're from all over the country. Um, and then they saw a misbehavior. Uh, and so as you see here, what makes this an experiment is that randomly, half of the teachers read about a black student misbehaving, and another half read about a white student misbehaving. And this was manipulated based on what past research has already found to be uh, stereotypical names for black children or white children. If you look at this infraction, you're seeing what is uh, uh, typically classified as classroom disturbance, which is the second leading reason why children are sent to the office and ultimately suspended. Uh, a thing to note about this is that it's not sexual harassment. It's not bringing a weapon to school. It's not bringing drugs to school. It's not fighting. But rather, it's something relatively minor in nature and more subjective in nature. And what we know in psychology is that in, in contexts that are subjective or ambiguous, that's when stereotypes can really shape the outcomes of those situations. Um, and so after they read this infraction, I then asked them a series of questions. The first three questions were, how severe is this misbehavior? How hindered do you feel from maintaining control over your classroom? And uh, how irritated are you by this child? Those three uh, items, teachers responded to them in the same ways typically, and so we averaged them into what I call feeling troubled. And what we found is that after that first infraction, there was no significant difference in how troubled teachers felt according to the student's race. This is what we would want to see. Um, I also asked teachers, how severely would you want to discipline this child? And again, we see no significant difference in how severely they want to discipline the child according to the child's race. And so back to the time element and how trait uh, characteristic or labels can, 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 can play out in relationships, we told teachers that the same student misbehaved again three days later. And so this is getting at how an ongoing relationship plays out with a teacher and a student. And then they read about a second infraction. I can tell you now. Uh, that uh, we randomly counterbalance these infractions, and so the order in which these infractions came didn't matter. Or, um, and then also, uh, if you look at this infraction, uh, this is what would be classified as insubordination or willful defiance, which is the number one reason for children to be sent to the office and suspended across the country. Um, again, it's not fighting, it's not sexual harassment or anything like that. Um, and so then I asked teachers the same question, and some interesting things happened. First of all, after the second infraction, now we do see a significant difference. The teachers feel significantly more troubled by the exact same misbehavior if it was by a black child compared to if it was by a white child. Another thing to notice is what we are now calling the black escalation effect, and that's looking at how there is a sharper escalation and how troubled the teacher feels over time if the child was black compared to if the child was white. We found the same pattern for how severely the teacher wanted to discipline the child, such that they wanted to discipline the child significantly more severely if the child was black compared to white. And we see that sharper escalation and how severely they want to discipline the child as well. And so what we see here is that, yes, uh, 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 teachers uh, can discipline children differently according to their race. But then uh, we didn't want to stop there. We want to know why. Is it a stereotyping process? And so I also asked teachers how likely they would be to label the child a troublemaker. And they were much more likely to do so if that child was black compared to if that child was white. Uh, didn't want to stop there. Wanted to know what is it about uh, stereotypes or stereotyping that leads to this change over time. Uh, and that speaks to what I was talking about earlier with how labels might bear out. Um, and the idea being that this might communicate something over time. And so he asked teachers, to what extent is this student's misbehavior indicative of a pattern? And they were more likely to feel like it was indicative of a pattern if the child was black compared to if the child was white. And so this is showing us that in this context, and possibly many other contexts, the, a, 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 a large function of stereotypes is that it serves as glue that sticks two unrelated incidents together and makes it look like a larger pattern that's growing over time and lets people respond accordingly. Uh, also ask teachers um, how likely it would be that they would suspend the child down the road. 
Uh, these bars are low on this scale because they should be. They were minor infractions. Uh, however, even at, the, uh, at this low level, uh, they are significantly more likely to think that they're going to suspend the student down the road if the student was black compared to white. And so we entered this into what we call mediation analysis. And sure enough, uh, the blackness of a child, and I use the word blackness on purpose because not only uh, could we look at the effects by the actual name of the, the, the child, but we also asked all participants how likely is it that this child is a black child. Um, and so that gives us a continuous variable. And the more black that they thought the child was, the more effects, negative effects that we saw on the other measures. And so the blackness of a child communicates that this is a pattern of misbehavior. And in turn, that leads them to be more likely to discipline the child severely and see themselves suspending the child down the road. And so on the teacher side, we do see that bias can lead to a difference in how misbehavior is perceived and responded to. We then wanted to look at, oh, well, before I get to that, I then went back and looked at the uh, Department of Education's uh, uh, data for students across the country and wanted to know if the research we just did is actually similar to what's going on in the real world. And uh, so their data is broken up in if a child received a single suspension or if they received two or more suspensions. Um, and looking at a chi-square analysis, um, the increase, or the uh, yeah, the increase in uh, having a single suspension versus multiple suspensions uh, is significantly larger for Black children than children of any other racial group, and that looks eerily similar to the effects that we found in our experimentation. I can tell you now, uh, as a side note that pertains to the school to prison pipeline, that this exact type of graph is what you find in criminal justice. Black uh, people make up about 16, 14 to 16 percent of the total population in the uni uh, United States, but they make up, uh, make up about 45 percent of the people incarcerated in the United States. And that is even more uh, stark if you look at repeat offenses, uh, especially in states that have uh, two strikes laws. And so we see that teachers discipline students differently according to race. Didn't want to stop there what might be happening from the student's perspective. And so this is research uh, that uh, uh, I'll be uh, joining uh, with a package with David and Jeff. But in this data, I looked at a nationally representative sample from the Bureau of Justice Statistics that had information on how children might feel about their teachers. Um, and so some things that uh, they had in the survey that I was able to use was what is the uh, household income uh, and on average, that was 11 on their coded scale, but that's the equivalent of $35,000 to $40,000 a year. Um, they had the race of the child, and I separated that by racial stigmatization. Uh, and so black, Latino, and Native students stigmatized, and white and Asian students non-stigmatized. Um, and then also, uh, this is, uh, pertains to a separate line of research, but I'll tell you now, they also had an item that asked the child if there is a police officer present at their school. And so as a side note, I can tell you now that if there was a police officer at their school, across the board, all students felt less respected at that school. They also asked items that pertain to how they felt about teachers. And I put this together in what I called perceived teacher respect that basically had to do with the extent to which they thought teachers treated students with respect, thought teachers cared about students, minus uh, uh, the, the, the idea that um, teachers don't uh, make uh, students feel good. Okay, and so the higher on the scale, the more perceived respect. And so what we're looking at here is uh, on the horizontal axis, or I guess I can say x-axis in this crowd. Um, we have socioeconomic status such that the farther right is the higher socioeconomic status. Uh, the y-axis is perceived respect from teachers. The first thing you see is that overall, um, the higher the socioeconomic status of the, the household, the more respect students feel from teachers at school. But then let's look at the, the racial composition. And so the green line is uh, uh, race, I mean, non-racially stigmatized students, and the gray line is racially stigmatized students. Um, and I should remind you that the mean is actually here. Um, and so this, this graph can be a little misleading. It's, if I did it as a scatter plot, it would make more sense, but basically, all of the data is around here. Um, and these are more like outliers that are happening. But what we're seeing right here is that black and Latino children, on average, feel like they are receiving less respect from teachers than their peers feel. Um, 
And another thing to notice is the interaction that's going on here, such that it seems like uh, household income does predict how, respect, uh, how much respect a child feels if they're white or Asian. However, regardless of the household income for racially stigmatized children, uh, that, that, that's not predicting as well uh, how much respect they feel. Okay, and so overall what we see is that teacher bias is, uh, uh, or that, yeah, teachers are disciplining students differently according to their race, and we're seeing that students of different racial backgrounds feel like they're receiving different levels of respect. And so I wanted to, and so we then took this research and put it into a psychological intervention. Uh, this is uh, through the PERTS uh, program here at Stanford uh, and work with David Paulnescu and Gregory Walton. Um, and so the first thing we wanted to do is see, is it possible uh, to shift teachers' mindsets uh, to be less likely to label a child a troublemaker? Um, and the way uh, we thought about doing that is with empathy. And so in this experiment with currently practicing teachers, uh, randomly half of the teachers read about how good teacher-student relationships uh, uh, are critical for students to learn self-control, and the other half of teachers read about how um, punishment is critical for children to learn self-control. And what we found, and so then I, uh, uh, after they engaged with this material, they read a whole article about it, not just a sentence, uh, and they answered a series of questions about it, really engaging with the materials and talking about how this statement is in fact true, that uh, good relationships or punishment is the key uh, to getting self-control. Um, I then uh, showed them uh, the same type of setup or experiment as that first experiment with teachers, and so they read about misbehavior, um, um, a child misbehaving, and what we found is that if teachers had engaged with the message about empathy, they were significantly less likely to see themselves labeling the child a troublemaker, okay? And so we're getting away from that label. Also, this time around, instead of asking them the, uh, how severely they would discipline the child, we asked them, uh, uh, how would you discipline a child? And so qualitatively explain what you would do. We then had raters code those responses uh, and looked at them according to the condition that the teachers were in, and we found that uh, teachers who were uh, engaged with the empathy uh, message were significantly less likely to threaten the child, assign attention to the child, or send the child to the office, and they were more likely to ask the student why the student misbehaved and to adjust the context. And so to get at empathy, let me explain more about that one. In the incident uh, in which you, uh, we, we all looked at in which the child's walking around the classroom throwing tissue away uh, in a way that's getting the attention of other students, Teachers were more likely to say that they would move that child's desk closer to the wastebasket or move the wastebasket closer to the child's desk. And so that's really uh, uh, adjusting the classroom to make it more conducive to better behavior as opposed to uh, punishing the child for what they're doing. Okay, and so then we wanted to see how might this change students' mindsets. Um, and so we set up an experiment in which we asked participants to imagine themselves uh, in middle school and that they are misbehaving uh, and that a teacher then responds to them. And so what we did here is that now they read the same uh, incident, but this time it's from the student's perspective, and randomly half of those participants read the responses that the teachers gave in the punitive condition. And so the teacher threatens them, gives detention, sends them to the office, and the other half uh, read about the, uh, how teachers responded in the other condition. Uh, Ms. Smith, um, ask why you're moving around the classroom, and moves your desk closer to the wastebasket. We then ask teachers, I mean students, a series of questions about how they would then feel. And we found that students were significantly more likely uh, to feel like uh, the teacher deserved their respect. They were significantly more likely or more motivated to behave well in class, and significantly more motivated to follow rules in the class. And so as a, we then entered that into a mediation analysis, um, and something that's particularly moving about this mediation analysis is that it involves multiple people. And so a teacher's mindset, the more empathic a teacher is, uh, the more empathic she disciplines the child, um, the more respect that the child feels for the teacher, and in turn, the more motivation the child has to behave well. And so all of this uh, was all a huge disclaimer uh, for a graph I'm about to show you. Uh, we ran an intervention uh, with every uh, middle school and three school districts. Uh, it's a very short, brief, scalable intervention that was 45 minutes in the fall, 25 minutes in the winter, and then we collected discipline records at the end of the year. Um, 
to say, now the intervention was a series of different ways of communicating uh, that students are learning and growing and that misbehavior is not a indictment, but rather it's an opportunity to uh, improve student behavior. They read stories about it uh, and they, uh, the whole intervention was set up uh, to be about uh, them giving their feedback on um, how empathy is in fact a good thing. Randomly, another half of uh, the teachers read about how technology is important for engaging students. And so something teachers already knew had nothing to do with empathy. We can look at the difference. All that was disclaimer for looking at this graph, because otherwise you wouldn't believe me, but there was a 50% reduction in suspensions uh, if a teacher had that empathic message. And so this is a 50% reduction across about 2,000 students. Um, and uh, some things to note about this, the number one predictor of suspensions is if you've previously, previously been suspended. So that's these bars over here. It is more likely. But regardless of if that happened or not, uh, uh, having an empathic teacher leads you to less likely to be suspended. Uh, the same across all race and gender groups, um, as we see here. Uh, but then something before I end, just to really drive home what the empathy is doing here, teachers in that empathy uh, uh, mindset were saying things like, I never hold grudges. I try to remember that they are all the son or daughter of someone who loves them more than anything in the world. They are the light of someone's life. And so that, that's, a, that's empathy, in my opinion. That's a, about as empathic as I can imagine a teacher being. Um, but uh, to really speak to the psychological prowess of this process, we actually only did the intervention with one of the children's teachers, the math teacher, for logistical reasons, because every student only has one math teacher, uh, and every student has to have a math teacher. However, suspensions are something that happen by all teachers, that happen by principals, that happen by coaches, that can happen in the hallway, that can happen on the playground. So what's happening here is that changing a mindset of a teacher, one teacher, can change the entire social world for that child and make that child less likely to be suspended across the school context. Um, and sure enough, we surveyed the students, asked them uh, how, uh, uh, how much respect they get from teachers at the school, and so all teachers at the school. If you look at the gray lines, I mean, we're looking at students who were suspended the previous year versus students who had no suspensions the previous year. If you're, you didn't have one of these empathic teachers, you felt less respected if you had been suspended before. However, if you had one teacher with that empathic mindset and not the same teacher because it was the year before, Having that one teacher leads you to feel you still have respect at that school. Um, and so I will end there and pass it on to Jeff. Uh, thank you.